dad was a uh, matter of fact, <laughs> you got to show me. I never saw him scared of anything. He said he screamed at my mom, get in the car now. And he said, Roger, as it was running, it was uphill to them. As it was running, the footfall, when the foot hit the ground, it would kick rocks towards them. And he got in the car, they got in the car and left. All right, Big Fist Society, you've got the privilege of talking with new friend, Mr. Roger Williams today from Tennessee. How's it going today, sir? Going a whole lot better than the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and it's great to finally get to talk to you. Oh, for sure. I've been waiting for this for a while, ever since we first connected. But I know you were under the weather, but we're ready to go now. How are things down there in Tennessee, Roger? Everything's going good. We've got Everything's blooming, so the, we all say we don't have allergies and we're all sneezing and coughing. But yeah, my, one of my favorite times of the year, though, we spend all day today outside. And the older I get, it takes me a little while to recover from that. I can't run with the kids as much anymore, but going pretty good. Can't complain. Good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> Roger, let's get right into it. Let's start chatting about your encounters that you had over the last few years. And where does this all start out for you? I'm learning things in reverse. I'm 52. I had some things happen. had a sighting when I was 14. had some things happen before that. But we didn't have any way of researching if you go to the library back then it was maybe one or two books and it would have Loch Ness Monster and UFOs and <clears throat> whatever but I found that just like other people that had sightings it never leaves you you may get away from it for a little while depending on what's going on in your life but it never it never goes away my sighting and stuff that's happened is not as dramatic as actually some of my friends that I've just found out recently. But we live in southern middle Tennessee, and it's actually there's actually a ridge system that runs in a circle from close to Alabama all the way above Nashville. And what I found is there's been a pretty active ridge system for years but to get back to how this got started i'll start when the finding bigfoot show was on i didn't i had no idea that, that show was on i was cooking for my son one day and he was about 15 and i guess he was watching youtube and so the oh how how he played that and I froze in my tracks. I got the got chills. I'm like, what what are you listening to? And he's oh, he started explaining. That's moneymaker, it's a new show. It's the how how supposedly it's Bigfoot. And I was like, I've heard that a half a dozen times. And the difference is hearing it on speaker versus actually live. You hear this a lot, <laughs> you feel it it goes through you and I believe at that time when the most activity was going on, they, there was a company that was strip mining for phosphate behind our house and where I hunted. And, um, and I believe it had, it made this thing mad. It was mad that it, it's just, it's home was being torn up. And that's just my, because before it was, other things, but not the screaming. And so I remember the first time I, I, I saw one and, and I don't know if there were several, I've talked to people lately since start, I started sharing my story 
that that are local that uh, seem to be more than one in this area. I always hunted. I was young. We lived out in the country. There, we didn't stay inside playing video games. It's just something you didn't do. We didn't have all that stuff. And so I would go out and check the fields for deer, wildlife. I just love being outside. And one one particular day, I stepped out in this field beside our house, and I hunted maybe 400 yards around the bend up there. And I had seen my dad, which he was 5'8". I'd seen him walk from that way a lot of times. So I'm looking, there's no, there's nothing in the field and I'm just about to step away and I notice movement to my left. I had misremembered thinking it was about 300 yards. My son and I went back a few weeks ago and it's no more than 200, but something stepped out on two legs. And at first, the first thing I noticed, of course, was the size. And, but I had seen the Patty film and I don't know if it was my young mind thought that's what all, that's what Bigfoot looks like. That's what all of them look like or whatever. This one was more, it was more athletic and it, I wasn't thinking Bigfoot at first, but <clears throat> you have to understand the, the walkway up this hill. I had done a lot of times and, the grass was intertwined. The, they didn't bush hog it much. They didn't keep it clean. So it was actually the shortest distance to get back to an alfalfa field that I like to hunt. But I would go the long way because of that high grass and walking uphill at the same time. And so it it turned its shoulders and looked my way. And I, it, I think it knew I was there because I had hunted those woods for years. I was 14. I'd, I'd been hunting those woods since I was eight. A lot of times going, just walking the creeks by myself and just doing kid stuff, and sometimes with my cousins or whatever. But I wasn't scared, I, I think, because of the distance. But I did know, notice that if you see someone 100 yards away, 200 yards away, you can see your hat your skin, the neckline of your color of your clothes, the wrist here, boot line. You know, it's a person. You know, they're wearing blue jeans. You may not know who they are, but uh, this thing was one color from where I was at, and it was the color of milk chocolate. It wasn't the dark color you hear people, and it wasn't red. It was in between. And so I knew I was seeing something strange. But when it started up the hill, there was it left no doubt because I knew how I had to walk up the hill and how my body, I had to maneuver my body to get over this grass, throwing my legs out to the side, up and over, and it was a struggle, leaning forward. This thing um, started up the hill, had a, just a little bit of body lean with uh, the back was more or less straight, but just a little lean. And have you ever seen a walking horse? Throw its legs up and over. You know, that how they doing the shows. This the, was the motion of this this thing, straight up and over over the grass, no struggling. And the time that it took to get from point A to point B, where I would have taken three to five minutes, this was over in twenty to thirty seconds, which is a long time to get to see something move. And so I didn't panic. And by the time it got to the top of the hill, my mind's just racing. Like, (laughs) it wasn't the neighbor. It wasn't my dad. And I told my dad about it, and he laughed. He said, that's probably Buford. And Buford was almost 90 years old. (laughs) And what I had seen had to be one of the best athletes in the world. Going back to that point, it... (sighs) I've had people tell me when I describe it that it was probably a teen or eight teenager as far as Bigfoot goes, because it had wide shoulders, but it was slender at the waist. Slend- and I was used to seeing the patty, the barrel shape. And so, yeah, 
that happened. And I told my dad, I said, you know, I think I just saw, I saw Bigfoot today and he laughed it off. And so that was the start of holding it back. And, and I think a lot of people have found out just recently in the past three months, since I talked about this for the first time public, publicly, I've had people come to me. Some of them don't care if they, if people know their name and some of them have jobs that they're scared they did get out and they have some amazing stories. One of my friends I went to school with in 2008, not far from here, I had the top off the Jeep, the doors off around midnight, him and his wife driving. And he said, this Bigfoot stepped almost into the Jeep and I'm in the path of the Jeep and almost, they almost hit. Well, Eric, he said he looks up and he can see the Bigfoot flinch. Oh no, I'm, I almost got hit. So he went to, uh, and he's been look, researching this ever since. And he went to the landowner and <laughs> he said, Hey, I need to ask you a question. He said, okay. He said, have you ever seen anything strange around here? And his word, the next words out of his mouth is I've seen the big boy twice. And so I haven't got to go to that spot yet, but that's on my list. <laughs> that is, that's incredible. Roger, oh, the first, the first encounter you shared, that's age 14. That's your age 14. Mm-hmm. Do you right. mind if I ask a few questions about that? It's a really interesting encounter. So you, you saw it walk up the hill through the ga- the grass in front of you. And then I just kept on walking, kept walking away then. Yeah. There, <clears throat> what it was, deer animals, let's just say animals. They don't want to be seen. Most of them. There was a, what I call a choke point up on top of the hill where there was a gate. And so when it stepped out, I don't think it was expecting me to be there. And so it had a decision to make. And it took the shortest distance to get behind some trees. But also that gate never stayed shut. It was it was an old farm gate that vines had grown over. So it walked all the way up and I barely could see it behind those trees and that those thicket, that thicket, but I believe it the direction it was going, that's what it did because the fence row to its left was uh, honeysuckles grown up, vines, just took, it could have, of course, went through if it wanted to, but it took the path of least resistance and the path that was farthest away from me. And yeah, it just walked to the, it was heading toward the, the back alfalfa field that where I had heard the screams later. And so I, with some other things that have happened that had happened, I started putting things together. There was one day we don't in the South, we don't get a chance to hunt in the snow much. And that's just it. And there was a forecast of some snow on Saturday morning. It was school. It was school year. And I was excited. The guy had all my stuff ready the night before I got up and going by myself. I was probably, this was before the sighting. So I'm going to say 12 to 13. And I know that sounds strange, but back then in the South, if you were safe, my dad, he trusted me and to go do, go where I said I was going to go and do the right thing. Eat a little breakfast, go outside. It's about you now two to three inches of snow and it's coming down big flakes. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I go my usual route, which is not too far from the siding I had later, probably 150, 200 yards. And when I, I come out of this, it was a logging road and it opened up into the field. And then the woods where my tree stand was at the time, they were so dark. It was daylight, but it just it had this ominous feel when I stepped out at the edge there. And I froze in my tracks and I'm looking around 
And I'm like, what is this? So I tried to take a step forward with my right foot two or three times and I couldn't. And in my head, I'm like, this is crazy. Don't be a wimp. You've got a 30, 30. You're, you're making this up in your head. I couldn't take another step forward. And my gut just was shaking. My stomach, my insides were just trembling. And I've always listened to my instincts and I, I was becoming scared. And something, I don't know why I did this. I, in my mind, I'm like, if you will let me go, I will turn to my right. I will walk back home and I won't come back out today. And as soon as I had that thought, it's like I was let go. And the feeling went away. The Everything went away. And I turned to my right. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. <laughs> Walked in the house. My mom and dad, they knew I'd been excited to go. It, it's 15, 20 minutes later. What are you doing? And I'm like, I lied. I didn't want to say anything. I was like, oh, it's cold out there. I think I'm going to stay in today. And didn't say anything. I didn't tell anybody that for a long time because I wasn't thinking it just that I, I was thinking I punked out. So you don't tell on yourself for that. But now looking back on it, I don't know. And I don't know about, I've heard so many ideas on what Sasquatch could be. You have the woo side, the natural side. And I've had a lady tell me, that the Sasquatch to- told her that it, there was a bear and they were protecting me. With, going back to my teenage years, I had things happen that I couldn't explain that didn't, I didn't think much about it, but now there may have been more interactions than I knew because we didn't know about tree knocks. We didn't know about the tree breaks. We didn't know about the whistles. You hear all this stuff and you're learning. You're a young hunter. You're, hey, something's whistling. It's a bird. It's whatever. But now, now when we hear something like that, you can tell the difference. Sometimes you can't. Everything And everything's not, I'm not one of those people. That everything's not a Bigfoot. I, if I get a new sound on, on, video or whatever i've got a, a friend that's former game warden he's i go right to him hey what is this do you know what this is and if he knows he'll let me know and then i'll go research that on youtube you know oh yeah that's what that is good to know i've been lucky enough that i did my re- my one resource was my friend don that he was a game warden for years around here He'd had reports. And so when I, I don't remember how it came up, but I started telling him about this stuff. He encouraged me and he asked me questions and he didn't make me feel, I guess, bashful about it. Cause I don't know how it was in all parts of the country, but th- you know, I heard somebody the other night say country people are like mountain people. You just don't talk about certain things. And that was the attitude I heard. They would say things like, uh, y'all need to be getting in before day, before dark and all that. But I did understand, too, some of that was trying to get the kids to just mind and come in. People use that a lot. But so going back, I'm never, I don't think I'll ever be like some of the shows for entertainment. Oh, that's a squatch or whatever people that don't that haven't been out in the woods they want things to be a sasquatch or whatever and it's just not the case but there have been other things that's happened my mom and dad my dad had shut me down pretty quick when i told him that story and it was about no more than two years later they were out, Southern folks, back in the day, not much population. They'd get out and they'd drink a beer or two, listen to music or whatever, and just relax or whatever in dirt roads. And 
never bothered anybody because the houses were so far in between. One night, he got out to relieve himself, and I think my mom might have too, and there was a bank. I think he was holding it about 12 foot high, and then he had a four foot fence and had the car running. The brake lights were, they were shining. The headlights were shining the other way. And he heard a tree snap, a big, a pretty good size, a sapling. He'd been out in the woods his whole life. So immediately he knew it had to be something big. A horse could rub up against something or a cow, whatever. But he said it was different. It was just, it was a, just like a snap, like it was just pulled, just snapped over, just in, instant break. And he, the next thing that happened, he heard it take off running, and it sounded like it was on two legs. Jumped the fence, landed in the road behind him. He didn't know how far back it was. It was too close, he said. And when the, when it landed in the road, it, he said it was boom, and he felt it. And my dad was a matter of fact, <laughs> you got to show me. I never saw him scared of anything. He said he screamed at my mom, get in the car now. And he said, Roger, as it was running, it was uphill to them. He said, as it was running, the footfall, when the foot hit the ground, it would kick rocks towards them. And he got in the car, they got in the car and left. So this place is called Simmons Ridge Road. And I just recently asked, we were driving through during the day and I saw some of the people that live, have been living there for years. And now I'm not as self-conscious about it. So I'll throw it into a conversation, right? <laughs> I'm like, Hey, you ever seen a Bigfoot? And uh, not all the, some of them will look at you like you're dumb. But, uh, every now and then you get the answer was no, but my brother said he saw one in the field back there. Right. So we drive up the road and this is the road that my mom and dad had the experience on. So we, we see my wife's cousins. I never had met them before. <laughs> she's supportive and she's heard some things and she's starting to believe. I never had met her cousin before. And I just did the same thing. Hey, you ever seen a Bigfoot? And he, his demeanor changed. He said, no. But I think I've heard one a couple of times just over this ridge. And she looks at me like, that's amazing. When we're talking about, as a crow flies, not three miles from my first sighting, right? You got all these ridges that inter interconnect and, and animals use those for quick getaways. They'll run a ridge and if, they, if something spooks them a deer, it'll take a let. They, they know where they're at. They know their getaway. They're av avoid people and whatever, predators. So the, these I think these rich systems, they're using them. or I don't know if they still are. Because after, the, after they tore the terrain up when I was 14, the screams and the activity slowed way down. It's almost, I guess nothing because after the last few screams I heard and felt, they were finishing up. And you got to understand, we take, it don't sound like much to somebody in Wyoming, but here you take a couple thousand acres and clear it. You've, you've taken away their travel or any animal, their travel where they can stay hid. And it was pretty thick back there. And they turned them into just, fields but for the stories that i've heard talking to people i think they didn't move too too far i think maybe north a little bit along the there's a duck river with rocks and outcroppings my my wife's family they have about it's about 130 acres up there it's about 20 miles from here and we've recently had had active. So from 14 or 15, we moved to an area not far from Simmons Ridge, but I didn't have anything happen at that location. 
it was always in the back of my mind. There was only one instance that I heard a tree snap with my cousin. I had uh, killed a deer. We had to track it. It got dark on us. And there was no, there were no cows. There was, shouldn't have been anybody out there in the dark way out where we were. And I always thought it could have been a mountain lion, but now going back and thinking of how it actually sounded, it would have had to been a very, a 200 pound something stepping on a green fall, tree fall. And now it makes more sense that it was a, maybe a snap, but, but I don't know that. I'm not going to say that's what it was. But went all these years, didn't forget about it, but didn't, I didn't go looking for this to start with. So I wasn't, the only time I ever looked for tracks was when they did finish up the fields and they had moved all the dirt out. And I'm like, you know what? This is where this thing walked up through here. And if it's something this big in the woods, it's going to leave track. So I did go when that was fresh. And that's, I think that's the only time I really looked for tracks and I didn't find any. Okay. We fast forward and probably three years ago, my son, he has some family in the South end of the, even further South than here. And we're not, we're, we are 25 minutes from the Alabama border. So we're, I, and I've heard a lot of stuff come out of North Alabama, Northeast, especially in the hills. He was, I hadn't hunted in years. And he was like, Dad, my uncle's going to let us hunt. And he said, you could come too. I'm like, oh, I don't, okay. And it was more or less, I went as just to have an experience with him. And I was like, look, I won't, I'll carry some a rifle with me. I won't be hunting. I'll just be there and we'll, We'll carry walkies with us. And so we had to, it was two weeks before the season. <laughs> and I'm like, do you know anything about the place? He said, well, not really. I said, well, we need to go scout a little bit. <laughs> and Bigfoot's the farthest thing from my mind. We go up there, we find the water sources, we find the um, the food, we find the fences, the holes in the fences where they travel. And we're just having a big time walking. We're, and we're not being that quiet because we're just scouting and we get to a particular point and I see a tree about five and a half foot up and it's a hardwood it because when whatever snapped it it splintered and just like a high pressure snap being me and I've always taught him to question and look for the answers don't assume so I'm looking around and I don't see anything that fell on it. I don't see anything. At that time, the top was still there, attached. And I'm looking around. I'm like, you know what? I'm, think, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I've seen some of these shows that say this is a marker. Could be a marker. And <laughs> don't go past it, whatever. Maybe it was Les Stroud and those guys. But... I really, I wasn't thinking Bigfoot, but it was odd, very odd, and no reason for it, okay? So I had my phone in my pocket, my shirt pocket. I stepped past this tree, and this all happened at the same time. So Siri, which I'm scared to say it, she might wake up here on my phone, triggered, and my voice is the only thing that's supposed to trigger that. and. Siri said, I don't quite understand. And I looked down in my pocket and I grabbed the phone. As I'm grabbing the phone, about the size of your double fist, a rock comes over the cedar, up the hill, over the cedar thicket. They're not very high. And lands, I'm going to say 12 to 15 yards from us, bounces down. And I hear it to my right. My son's looking at it. I hear it. I look up. I see the rock slowing down. And, but there, it was so much to take in all, all of a sudden. Now I've got my son out here and we just had a rock thrown at us. And there's nobody out there. And you root something that throws rock has to have a thumb or two, <laughs> has to have a hand. 
So I didn't rap right away. What I was doing, I was thinking, what is our best action here? Because <clears throat> any wild animal, you don't want to run. You don't want to trigger a response to get attacked or whatever. So I'm thinking, what's the best thing we need to do? My son, he's so funny. The first thing out of his mouth, he said, are we just going to ignore that we had a rock tossed at us? I'm like, no, Peyton, just calm down. Just hold on. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what we need to do. I said, so here's what we need to do. We need to walk down the hill backwards so we're facing whatever this is. And don't look up in there. Let's get away and we'll talk about this. And so we went back to the truck and we're like, what just happened? And so we started talking about the marker. I said, the tree, it was right there at the tree. And he said, what was up with Siri? I said, I haven't, that's never happened before. So my question, hearing people talk about infrasound and all this, could infrasound trigger Siri? Because I've had that feeling. I've seen people like, where they go with the, with the line and they measure the infrasound and they're like, oh, do you feel anything? And they're jittery and whatever. And so that's my first question was like, no, neither one of us said a word. So that's not supposed to happen. Second of all, we got the marker and then we got the rock toss. The Siri by itself wouldn't have been a big deal. The tree by itself wouldn't have been a big deal. But put together with the rock toss, it became very big deal. And it scared me because... But we didn't feel threatened, though. That's what we talked about. We didn't feel threatened. We talked about, should we go back? And we did. We went in before daylight. I mean, we had put him up a stand. And a few days after that, where I hunt is not 200 to 250 yards from that spot. Where he hunts is over, over the ridge. It's not 150 yards. And... Like I said, we've never felt threatened there. And there have been times, um, one morning I, I was there had and the, the breeze was blowing. It was from up the hill. I don't know what direction actually that is. You pay attention to it as a hunter. You Okay, we got the breeze coming this way. I knew that Peyton was good and that I was good anything up the hill. And I'm sitting there, I've been sitting there for 45 minutes. It's, it hasn't started breaking daylight yet, but it's getting close. So they're, so fresh air, nice morning. I'm close to the spring, a water source. And I'm actually sitting blind on the ground, which I don't like doing that. But I was backed up into a, a bank with some trees and stuff. So I felt like I had that spot covered, keep something from walking up on me. I get a, a whiff of uh, the only thing I, it did smell like a wet dog, but it had a, an element like death, decay. No, let's decay. Wet dog would decay, right? And I perked up, it, it's behind me. And that's where the wind was blowing. It was just a light breeze. Maybe three seconds, it was quick. But here's the thing. You know, I've smelt dead animals. and But when if you do and the wind's blowing to you, you're going to keep smelling it. Right? So I'm like, this thing is moving. Whatever this is, it's moving. And I got on the walkie and I'm like, Peyton, I'm not trying to scare you. We've got something coming in between us that stinks like something I've never actually smelled before. And it, it's moving. I think it's coming to you. He never got a whiff of it, which is even more strange. And we have smelt this on more than one occasion. And he's got a whiff of it a couple of times. But we've never felt threatened. And he's had some strange things, some sounds. He was by himself one day, and I got a text. I'll check up on him quite a bit because 
it's in the middle of nowhere. And he's 25, so he, he can take stuff, but you just don't. It's not smart to hunt by yourself, but as long as he checks up with me every so often and I said, let me know when you're leaving and all that. He said, Daddy, I just heard what sounded like a monkey. He said it was the, the, the build up, ooh, 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 and then a, a, ye- a kind of a yell. He said it wasn't a scream, and it was the direction it came from was over the the same direction as the marker and the rock throw, but even farther over on the other side of the hill. And he said, at first I thought it was a bull. He said, but on the beginning of it, but as it followed through with it, he said it it wasn't. And he, in a little bit of his background, he's always loved animals. If you have a question about an animal, I don't care if it's in Australia, he grew up watching Steve Irwin. He, the teachers loved him because they could ask him about this rare bird in Mexico. And he was like, oh, yeah, that, that was his thing. So he's not inexperienced as far as things like, you know, and he's really level-headed. He's, the first thing we do is we question, what could this be first? Always, and you'll find the answer a lot of times. That's why I'm saying not everything's a Sasquatch. I really like the way he he approaches things, and when but when he tells me something, I believe him because it, because it's between us. It's no sensational. It's just hey, daddy, we might need to keep an eye on this or whatever. We've had strange things happen, and we've been there. We went back last year, and it was dry. The that's the first thing I, we knew it was dry in our county. But that's the first thing I noticed. The spring was almost nothing. The ponds were dry. It had a totally different feel. The whole area did. We didn't hear anything. We didn't see anything. And we've been several times where we didn't. But last hunting season, after that, he's walking his ridge up to his tree stand. And I go to my spot. And we and what, we don't text each other because it lights up, right? I got a text. So when I got a text, I'm like, oh, <laughs> and it, it's really a miracle that I actually got the text because of the signal, the lack of signal back in there. And the picture's coming through and it took a while. And if, when it finally came through, I don't know, you may have seen the picture in the, one of the groups on Facebook, but it's uh, the thorn tree. It's really hard, really tough, no scuffs on it. And so, it looked something had taken like this and broke it down. And there was probably, 150, 200 of those in this, on this ridge. And it used to be a field and it's grown up now. And he saw it and he snapped a picture of it, got the flash. And he like, WTH, <laughs> what the hell is this? And so after our hunt's over with, he takes me up there. And that's the first thing we do. We look around it. We look, maybe see if a tractor maybe have done, had, made that damage i didn't think so because of the way it was done all of the thorns some of the thorns are three inches long all of those branches and thorns are intact so if a truck runs over something like that they're going to knock some of those off if a a bull rubs up against it it's going to knock some of those off everything was intact except that fork and it was and so have you ever, when we were kids, when we'd have sat, we'd be out, we didn't have a lot of toys, we'd be outside all the time. When you're seven or eight years old, we would go and pick a sapling, climb up it a little bit, and it's not going to support your weight. So you would ride it down, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So when one of those breaks, it, I'll call it a soft break, it'll bend, it'll put pressure, you know, and it, give it'll give way and it'll split but it it may split in a bunch of different places or whatever and you you can tell that the pressure was from up in the tree and then somebody wrote it down well these what's strange about these particular trees being a harder wood and it looked like something just snapped it right there at that point if you take let's say i may have one here 
I know this is crazy. I don't know if anybody can see this or whatever, but I've got a, a number two pencil. If I take and break this thing like this, it's bending. And it's going to break somewhere in here. But if I push pressure right there, well, I know where it's going to break. It's going to break right there. And that's a high pressure break. So that's the difference in something that's a softer wood that, so anyway, and I'm no expert. I just been in the wood and, you know, it, and I'm always open to somebody educating me. I notice things like that. And if I can't explain it, I'll keep trying, but some of these I can't other. And I don't know if you've heard Mike Bluler. I haven't. No. Okay, he's I, I help co-host with him on Red Creek Mafia on YouTube, and I heard his story on Cliff and Bobo podcast mm. coming home from work, right? Mm-hmm. And it there were some things he said that made me realize. Okay, one thing he was talking about was the size of the forearm. He had a really close encounter, lasted a while. But the size of the forearms and the fingers look like bananas, the size of bananas. And I'm driving home and I'm like, if that's the case, then what I thought was a a tough tree break for something might not be as hard as what I thought. So I contacted him through email and I can I talk to you? Because this stuff started happening. I start I started there's podcasts now, of course. And he was nice enough <clears throat> to answer back and we hit it off. And I just, I asked him all kind of questions like, what did this look like? What did that look like? And we've learned, so, we've learned a lot of stuff in the last three months because of the guest that's come on. Because I told my story, or one of my stories, I had a friend contact me on Messenger on Facebook and said, hey, Raj, you remember when my brother and I lived Verona, Caney Creek, whatever? I'm like, yeah. He said, we walked up on one. They were like 12. He said, we walked up on one. He said, the farmer had said keep an eye out because something was stealing his calves. And he said, when they fished the creek down there, they would walk through and they heard some of the calves bawling and making noise and so they walked over there and he's got his brother with him younger brother a couple years younger and he said we he said my mind couldn't make sense of it at first but it was a bigfoot and he had a calf by the leg dragging it through a fence and when it saw us he said it looked irritated that we had seen him and he let the calf go, turned, walked off and turned and looked at him and did a huff, <laughs> you know, and he said, I saw his teeth. He's close enough, 20 yards. He saw his teeth and he stepped over the four, four strand of barbed wire, just stepped right over it and walked across this field. And I'm just, I'm floored. I talked to him for two hours. I'm like, Kevin, how could, how come he said, I didn't know everybody was laughed at me. I'm glad you finally. You told your stories. I don't feel as crazy now, but I know what I saw and nobody ever tell me. Wow. And this was something that he had a 30 second to a minute sighting and up close and personal. And that, see, I'm not the bravest person in the world. So that 200 yard cushion that I had, even though I was probably wrong, I felt like I could get to the back door quick, quicker than he could get me which that's how kids think, <laughs> but uh, 20 yards, 15, 20 yards. I don't know if I would make it through that heart. Wise. But uh, it just, it just confirms there, there are people around this country that might listen to this. It's okay. Now the, I don't know if this shows the negative. If you say something about Bigfoot, I mean, I've got, deodorant in the uh, right in the it's, it's everywhere yeah right it's everywhere <laughs> i've got stuff people give me i told this story and uh, i thought yeah they're gonna think i'm nuts somebody went to branson missouri and brought me back this poster that's got a, 
a Sasquatch themed park there. I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. And so now, but here's the problem. <laughs> the problem now you run into, which is a little bit before, I didn't go looking for this. I, we do go out now, and I've gotten a couple situations where I've slowed down a little bit, but there are people that want to have an experience so bad that mm-hmm. every every leaf, every twig break, every the other night. Yep. I know exactly I, what you're I, talking I, about, Roger. Yeah. And you don't want to – I'm sitting there telling you I saw a Bigfoot, so I can't tell another person they didn't. Right. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to listen to you. Now, if you show me pictures and you've been faking some stuff, I'm not going to hurt your feelings, but I'm just going, oh, yeah, that's cool. But if it's if it looks legit, I'm going to pick your brain. Hey, can you take me out there? Yeah. So, I, I, but I think I can, my BS meter is pretty, pretty good. <laughs> now, right? there's, yeah, now there's some will get past you, but that's okay. But I, I think some of them want an experience so bad they'll 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 see pictures, they'll find things, the paradoia thing. They'll and but I can't say anything about that. I've got I had a couple of things happen to me where my son he said, "What is this?" and he circled it, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" And it and I've got a picture that I'll send you later. I had a tree fall. We had a gifting spot. We tried this. We heard these other people. So we had some activity. We had some strange sounds, strange smells, sounds for footfalls. Like it came off one of the large rocks and boom, like a 600-pound cow, but two feet. A lot of strange things was happening at this one location, and we would go out there at night. I used to sit outside the truck. Now I sit inside the truck. I don't. But we went back one day, and we gifted. We put some some fruit and stuff out there. Well, me, my son and I, we were out there and <clears throat> I've got it on audio on the video, but it, it's hard. And I'm embarrassed because it scared me so bad that I said some very ugly words. <laughs> it just came out and I'm like, I didn't even realize it did it until we replayed it. And what happened, we went in, we found the spot where we'd had all the strange stuff, the, the smells and stuff at night so we went in during the day and it's on some family land and we had a bag of fruit and we had a a rake with me to what i was going to do was put out some stuff and then rake all the leaves up and clear in case something stepped in to get it then i would maybe get a footprint or something like that and as soon as we walked in not only did we hear stuff, but we could hear stuff before we heard stuff. Like we heard it sounded like a log was thrown, like a log that had been down for a few months. A log was thrown and it was thrown so hard. And there's these big rocks. It's close to that river I was talking about. So a lot of the topsoil was gone. And it sounded like it was thrown against one of those rocks and it broke. And it didn't sound like it was green. It was, it'd been there a while. But the thing was, we were so close, we heard it pick it up and pick up like you pick up one end and drag it to you. Oh, wow. And you can hear me in the video. I'm like, wait. So before all these sounds, these big sounds, we could hear this, the other movement. And then we get the high pressure tree snaps just crack. And we're talking 50 to 60 yards through the woods and just out of sight. All this stuff. This happened here has just been out of sight. Trees been, I'm going to say, I hate to even say pushed over, but what are the odds of these trees falling? And I had one, I've got it on video, where I went back by myself a couple of days later to check the fruit. And this tree that had been broken and suspended there, it decided to fall while I was videoing, fall the rest of the way. And that's where I get the, <laughs> I hate to say this, the cloaking look figure in the picture. I didn't see it while I was there. So, but something, and my son and everybody's looked at this video is like, it almost looked like it was pulled down. Like being up over here and 
then this back end responded to it. So anyway, the day, the couple of days before, we had all this activity. We had a, a it sounded like a maybe a thirty pound boulder toss. This, like I said, it's about fifty yards away, and it, like all this noise. It sounded like something was irritated that we were there. But the final thing, um, so close to the final thing that scared me was a series of sounds where I heard it, I heard something pick up something, like a tree that had fallen or something. And then the best way I can explain it after listening to it 50 times is it sounded like it picked it up. I heard that. And you know how some of the tennis players grunt when they hit the tennis or when they exert a lot of energy or I don't know if baseball players do it, but maybe somebody with an ax, they're putting everything they've got into it and you hear that. When I hear the right as the tree or whatever it was hit another piece of wood and it broke, there was a huff so loud and so big that I can just imagine the nostrils just being massive and it was so deep. And that's when the cuss words come out and I'm like, oh, we may be in trouble. And here I am thinking, you idiot, you've got your son out here and you done walked up in the middle of something and you may not be able to get out of it. That's how big this thing sounded. What's interesting is, of course, the video doesn't do it justice as far as the volume. But everybody we've shown this video and they put the headphones in and they listen to it. So here's what we get. That sounds like a lion. That sounds like a bear. That sounds like a all these huge mammals, right? Southern middle Tennessee. We don't have lions. <laughs> we don't have, I don't know if a bear can make that sound. They're talking, it, it, but when they hear it, they know it's something big. And it's not a horse. A horse, you hear a horse, you know what a horse sounds like, right? This thing expelled so much air while it was exerting this pressure or this energy that I could almost see the nostrils in my in. It, it had to be huge and it had to be big to, to make the noises. And we had a final tree break, but what we did, it, it did, it scared me. Um, it scared me so bad that we didn't go back for a while. But I said in my head, Oh, I told my son, you can see in the video. I said, okay, clear your mind. And I said, we're not here to hurt you. We're not here. To, we're just curious and we don't want to be hurt either. We're just, if I didn't know if that was the right thing, but I felt like it's something I need to do. And when I did it, I don't know if it's endorphins or what it was, but I got this euphoric feeling. So I'm being cool and calm, trying to be. And I said, Titan, what are you feeling right now? And he said, the whole feel of the woods just changed. Now, I don't know if that's power suggestion. I don't know if that made us feel better. It could be. But what we went through for 15 minutes and that ending on that, I knew we would we tick something off. I knew it. I, I knew we this thing's not good. And we took a break. He hadn't been back. He has not been back. He's not a small guy. He can take care of himself. And he said, I'm not going back there. I did the next day, or I keep saying that, a couple of days later, and that's when the tree was either pulled down or fell down. And I don't know. I, I can't explain a lot of this stuff. Talking, it is good to talk to people and get their opinion to what it might be. You know, if you, when you get that gut feeling something's wrong, I'm 52 years old. I've done some stupid stuff. I've got scars. I've got broke bones. And just before that happened, you get this feeling like, oh, I did it again. Some of this is, we started having this, these interactions, and I think we got a little overzealous. And we're not, we're trying to figure out some things, and I just don't want to get hurt in the process. I don't want to get him hurt in the process or anybody. And there's so much, there's so much that's happened. I, my wife was with me one night at the same area, and uh, 
over to our right, she's on the, the way I park. The left side is where this area is, and she can hear and see on this right side. It's dark, good and quiet. And she said, what is that? What? And she said, up in that tree. And just across the drive back in there, there's some trees and saplings, a few cedars, and there was a light. It wasn't like, it wasn't fluorescent. It wasn't LED or anything that bright. It was more of a, uh, like a moon, a moon, like when it's uh, not in its bright, it's not a full moon, just half or crescent or whatever. So I'm looking at it and that, that's the first thing I think, what's the moon? She said, no, <laughs> it's not because it's over there. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking, and it's not pulsating. It's not, but it, it does get gradually bigger. It's about the size of a, just not quite the size of a tennis ball when I first see it, and it's not perfectly round either. <clears throat> and we keep watching this one for 15 or 20 minutes. This is the same area. I have people say, well, that, that comes along with the Bigfoot. And we watch it, and I back the truck up to get different views of it. And I said, how far do you think that's up in the tree there? She said, I don't know how to tell. I said, well, do you know how high a basketball goal is? She said, oh, yeah. I said, do you think that's in which it was? I said, you think that's about the same height? She said, yeah, it is. I said, so it's not a person with a light. We're ruling that out. It, it got bigger, and it was misshapen, and then it come back gradually after 20 minutes, and I would move forward and backward to get better looks at it, and it just faded out. We don't know what that was. It shouldn't be there. I went a, a few days later, go in behind during the day and look to see if there's any trail cams, any light sources, any any place where something like that could be hung up there. And it's not. There's there was no place. There's no tracks, the leaves. There's no disturbances. So no, it, it wasn't something somebody put up there. Is what I'm saying. And that's that in itself is just strange. But and then you pair it with this other activity that we've had, and we just don't know. We were out in we've been married a little over three years. We've been together four. So she's she's so good. When we first met, let's say Skinwalker Ranch. Some of the uh, some of the Bigfoot shows, some of the YouTube stuff. I, she, I'm like, she's gonna think I'm crazy, but she didn't. We're in uh, Dubois, Wyoming. Two years ago in April, this, this yeah, it was two years ago. And we go back. I think it was Tory Lake. We we went to Cowboy Cafe. We, we got something to eat, and we had enough time to go back in here. I had actually looked it up. It was a place you could drive back and. Just beautiful. <clears throat> Nobody back there. And I'm, I had a video going, and I made the comment, being stupid, just being extra country. I don't know if y'all know this or not, boys, but this is it's a Yeti country right here. And I was going to send it back to my buddies and show them just how it's hard to describe how beautiful this was and how far back and the river. And the, I expected to see a grizzly or mountain lion any second. And or whatever bears they have. We go to the back. We go nine miles back in. <clears throat> we turn around. We got the windows now. We're coming back out. and <laughs> I'm barely tri going. We're looking at everything. We're in awe. And to on her side of the truck, there's an aha how. Now, it's not <laughs> like the, it didn't have the volume that that uh, I had heard before. And when you get in those mountains, that mountain may look like it's a mile away. It could be 10. So I actually thought it was somebody messing with us. But then when you think about it, who, there were no vehicles. It might have been a hiker, right? But she looked at me and she said, I, she said, did you just hear that? I'm like, yeah, I actually did. What do you think it was? She said, all I know, I've been watching too many of those damn shows with you. <laughs> Where was this again, Roger? This was in Dubois, Wyoming. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. And wow. It was. Uh, 
I had talked to Don, my game worn friend. He's now Roger. Don't write it off because it could have been a smaller one and it could have been two miles away. And I'm like, well, you're right. But like I said, that my my first instinct is to explain things away. And because it didn't have the volume that the one I had heard several times, I just thought <clears throat> maybe hopefully it was somebody because this stuff scares me a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going to be out in a tent. I talked to a guy. I got a new job. And there was a guy, um, one was from Minnesota, and the other guy, we were in training, and the other one was from uh, California. And uh, I didn't bring anything. I, I noticed the one guy had a Sasquatch hat on. He was from Wisconsin. And the guy from California said, oh, you you believe in Sasquatch? He said, oh, yeah, we, we, we found a trackway in the snow one time that was just um, unbelievable. And I, of course, here I go, I'm, my head's turning. <laughs> and this guy said, I had one walk into my camp one night up close to the Sierra Nevadas. He started naming uh, uh, Clackamas River and Humboldt County and all this stuff. And I'm, and it, I just keep leaning. I said, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Roger. <laughs> so I knew I could talk to these guys or just learn. And they had some amazing stories. He said <clears throat> he didn't see it because he scared him. He stayed in the tent. But I guess he had moonlight and maybe smells and sounds. And, and all of his friends, he said, had experiences back in the day. So it's been a it's been a whirlwind, Jeremiah. It, it's, once I told my story, the amount of stories that I have now, and I'm telling you, there are some people that I don't know, but there are some that I've known them all my life. And and, and some of them haven't watched the TV shows or listened to the podcast. There's one, the one I said, I can't say a name. So he sends me a message, a messenger after that first show I did. Thank you for explaining things the way you did because now what happened to me made sense, but I can't let it get out because of my job. I'm like, can you call me? So we talked on the phone for a while. He said he was on his porch and this is not far from me. This is actually close to some activity that's been going on for since the seventies. This is the same area, maybe 10 mile circle, right? He said he was out on his porch one night, <clears throat> rural area. His dog was there out there. He said it sounded. He said he heard a scream, and it sounded like a mixture between a woman and an elephant. It's the way he, in his mind, and uh, he said his dog peed on the porch, ran to the door, and he was trying to get in the door, and the dog was trying to get in the door. And he said he almost peed the porch too, <laughs> and uh, he and he. he wondering what it was he said but here he's the thing he said when you said you felt that scream i felt it too and he said and you and it made sense when you said it he, i said let me ask you some questions i said do you watch bigfoot shows no you listen to podcasts no i don't he said i don't know any of this stuff i don't know he said but when you said this or that it made sense <clears throat> so i kept listening <clears throat> then he said two weeks later was opening of gun season deer season here and they've got a little money <laughs> and so they're where i might have be in a tree stand or in a fold-out seat ozark trail from walmart <laughs> they've got these nice houses with plexiglass and it's almost too nice and i know exactly the one he's talking about <clears throat> and he said he said i'll get my four-wheeler back there and hide it. And then I'd walk across the field 45 minutes before daylight. He said, and this was two weeks after I heard that sound. He said, I go in, I get inside, I lock the door, a little flimsy door, but it, it locked. And uh, he said, there's a hickory tree on his dad. <clears throat> I don't forget too much away. He, his dad taught me how to smoke meat. And we did it the old way back in, back then. And, so they always had a lot of hickory 
cut and had huge smokers. And he said, there's one hickory tree. He said, I always would look at it, get daylight. And I was like, I hope my daddy don't cut that down. That's just such an awesome tree. <laughs> he said, I'm sitting there. He said, it's about 30 minutes or so before daylight. And I hear some grunting and growling and huffing. And he sounded like he said it sounded like something very large was upset. He said it wasn't a bull, it wasn't a cow. It had this uh, this he said, I just knew it wasn't, but he said that it was massive. He said, and it was in the fence row and it was close to the hickory trees near as I could tell. He said, so he was so scared that he took his chair and put it up against the door. He said, what I figured was it was dark and I didn't, he said, if it came in on me, whatever it was, I would feel the door moving and then I could maybe get a shot off or whatever. He said, I was scared to death. He said, 15 minutes before daylight, he still hearing some of the noises, not not as much, but it was maybe letting him know that it was still there. And then he heard a loud crash snap and didn't know what it was and heard another noise. <clears throat> and then after that, it went quiet. So it's getting close to daylight. It's getting close to sun, right? So he said he didn't know what to do. He said he was going to get to his four-wheeler as quick as possible, but he wanted to get all the way daylight, and he wanted to make sure whatever it was, wasn't in the area. And he said when it, the, it got where he could see, he said there's a branch, a big branch, about 10 foot up. He said it was broken, fresh, snap, you know, how bright fresh wood is. And he and so he his first instinct was like, I wonder when that happened. And then he, and he had just walked from his, at an angle from his uh, four wheeler to this thing, to, through the field. And he looks over, he's at 20 yards out in the field, that branch is thrown out into the field. And he said, Roger, that was five years ago. And I haven't been hunting since, and I'm not going back. So how do you, how do you explain once again, for something to break something like that, it has to have thumbs. And it has to be big. I feel like I'm just, I feel like I'm gushing here, but, but I've been inundated with stories over the past uh, I was three, three months, maybe. And it got to the point where it felt like I was filling up. And I do want to listen. And I will see you share your podcast on Twitter or somewhere. And I'll be like, I got to listen to that. I'm going to share it. So I'll go back and listen to it. But there was a point where I even I had to take a break with Mike helping co-host that show because there was so much information and I'm trying to filter through what could be real and what's not. And I got full. I got, I got just weighed down with it. And then I got sick and I got to rest. I got to, it's a bad way to get to rest, but I slept a lot. And after I got over that, I'm refreshed. And I, I think I'll give some people advice that's getting into this. Go at a pace, go at your own pace and don't try to get too much. Cause there are a lot of theories. And then there are a lot of people that are, or this side and, They'll get upset if you disagree with them. And some of it is so unreal. But like I said, I'm on a podcast with Jeremiah and I'm telling about this stuff. And I even talked about the ghost and the orbs and all this stuff that I've seen in the past. And it, and it makes me, that's why it makes me think that some of it may be tied together. And maybe some of us are without trying more open to things happening i don't know <clears throat> here's a theory i have now the scientist guys i get them but there's some people that you think about this i don't know if and people that are listening think about this there are people that mean no harm if there is a bigfoot they don't want it to be killed they don't want it to any harm they just want to understand a lot of those people seem to have experiences where 
you have, I know people that are mean <laughs> and would shoot one in a heartbeat and they hardly ever have any of those experiences. So if they can communicate or know your feelings or know your thoughts or whatever, then they would stay away from that person. I would think And those are the people who are like, Oh, you're full of it. And fire us all one. I would, they, they tell it, they think they would anyway, but I've, even Mike's encounter, he had the safety off the crosshairs on his nose and was scared. And he said he was about to pull the trigger and there was too much emotion and more human. Uh, he said it, it, it turned his head sideways. You better don't do it. Don't do it. And he said, and this Mike's former military and he was scared. And he said, I felt like if I pulled that trigger, I would partially be killing a human. And then he said, and I partially was scared that if I decided to pull the trigger, I might not make it out of the woods. So what he struggles with it, but he's a good guy. He's trying to, he's doing his show and he's trying to get people on so he can understand it. And I think that's, I think that's where a lot of us come from is we have had experiences and we start digging like the guy in the Jeep. His son told me, he said, ever since that happened to him, he's been everything he can watch, everything he can read. He talks about it all the time. And, and it's not driving him crazy. It's just, he wants to understand, you know, how and we have questions. Like one of the, one of the quest, main questions I have it's not paranormal. It's not. It's like, how do they take in enough protein? <clears throat> Be a lot of critters in one area to support yes. those guys. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, and so they almost have to be what omnivores. <clears throat> exactly. Protein, and then you get some people talk about the woo part of it, where their energy, and they can come through portals and. Mm. It, I, who knows? It's, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And you're smart in what you said earlier, where it's like, there's so much, <clears throat> excuse me, there's so much in this field right now that you have to pace yourself and you, it is okay to step away for a bit. If you find yourself being overwhelmed, that is a smart thing to do. It's not smart when you're not aware of that needs to be done. But I do have a few questions for you okay. that have come up while you've been talking. <clears throat> the different the different situations you've had, have you noticed that these have all taken place in one county? Except for the Wyoming, <clears throat> the yes. There's one that's close to another county, <clears throat> depending on what hill you're on. <laughs> but yeah, the Marshall County, Tennessee, I'll go ahead and and say it because I've got five or six people right now that that I'm in contact with. Oh, there's probably a dozen that's actually told me, but there's about a half a dozen that that, that we communicate about things that have happened mm. in the past, and the, and we talk about people that we all we've all known that things have happened to, and then you'll forget things. I have a, a very good friend. I oh, used to hang around him. He's a little older than me. Now, <clears throat> he's one of those macho guys. He's not going to say anything to make himself look bad or crazy. His dad has passed away, but he, I would believe anything to come out of his mouth. It was just because of the type of person he was. And he, he wasn't kin to me, but he gave me advice. He was just a, <clears throat> no frills country guy that had great listening skills he would listen to you if he thought he needed to say something he would if he he wouldn't butt into your business and um he was just a good man and so when matt told me the story i was about 90 percent on it but then when eddie his dad told me he heard all of it and he saw Mac running, and he's never seen him that scared in his life. He was about 13 or 14. But what happened in that situation, <clears throat> Mac hunted the fence line, 
up behind their house, and he had a single shot twenty gauge. He hunted everything with it back then, and he would crawl up. He'd climb up in this hackberry tree and get out on this limb and and sit there. And he said he he saw some movement coming along the woods line, which there's a little grass out there in the field. It wasn't a big field. And first thing he think was deer coming, turkey, something. And he said, and that's another thing. People, there's some people that can't get out, and I understand that. And they want to know things. So this is why I put little tidbits in like this. People that have been out in the woods or been around farm animals or been around been out, even a a zookeeper, somebody that studies all that, they can see an animal from a long distance and tell you what it is by the way it's moving, by the its gait, by its bouncing, its smoothness. A cat, you know, back will bend certain ways. The coyotes will prance a little bit, and they're lighter on their feet than a wolf. And it, it just so you identify things pretty fast. <clears throat> He said the first thing he noticed was it it was something about four and a half to five foot tall and it was moving, but it was doing this. He said the head was side to side and it was hunkered over. And he, what is that? Because now this guy, he's been around all these animals. And at first he sees it, he don't know what it is. So he's trying to identify it. It's getting closer to him, but the wind is coming from behind Mac to a certain point up in the woods, this thing is coming around and hasn't got to that point where it could wind him yet. And it's focused on the edge of the woods. And he said, then he gets a good look at it as it gets closer. He said it was four and a half to five foot tall. He said it looked like a monkey. He said the hair was clumped, greasy and clumped where in tufts where you could see skin under. And he said that's when he got really scared. And so he got his gun up and ready, but he he wasn't going to make a noise. He's just going to let it pass by. And that was his instinct, just to stay still and let it go. He said, when it got, he said, I knew the wind was behind me. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> and he said, it got to that point and it threw its nose up in the air, sniffed a few times. And he said, when it turned and looked, it locked eyes with him and it showed its teeth. And now back then, I didn't know whether to ask if it had canines or whatever I'm just listening to the story. So he said it it snarled and it like it made it mad and it said it came to him and it was making some noises. I don't remember what noises he said it made, but he said, I'm thinking, can I get down out of this tree and get home before this? We're talking 40 yards. And he made the decision that he could. Now, What happens next, he said he felt bad about it, but he was forced into it, he thought. He said he pulled the gun up, and he put it on the chest and squeezed the trigger, and he heard it thump. He said it it started rolling. It grabbed its chest, started screaming and rolling. He said it sounded like a monkey. Now, it could have been. I don't know what it was, but he got down. He's running. Now, he's built like me. I'm a bigger guy. (laughs) One of us running. (laughs) Don't ask any questions. <laughs> you know, you try to beat us. Get, but uh, so he's running and he said he takes a single shot, puts one in it, throws it over his back and fires recklessly back that way. Puts another one in it. Yeah. <laughs> and so he gets to the fence. He's trying to get his fat tail over the fence. And his daddy's, like, what is going on? He said, I just shot a monkey. <laughs> And he said, you could hear it screaming. Eddie said, I could hear it screaming. It's just right behind the house. And he said, boy, let's get in the house. And they didn't, they never went up there to see. Now that's, that's not as a crow flies three miles from where I saw mine, but it was a lot bigger. But, and oh, and going back to that sighting, there was a limb that came out. I don't know how to, it, it came out over the field and drooped down and curved back up. This thing walked, and when it stopped, it was under this, right? So I told my dad, I said, Daddy, it was almost as tall as that, that limb. I said, it was about six or eight inches under that limb, top of the head was. I said, that couldn't have been Buford. He said, there's no way. You know how 
far up that is? I said, yeah, I do. I saw. <laughs> we went up there with a tape measure, and whatever it was had to be around seven and a half foot tall. So we did get a measurement. And, we were, and he was questioning it. He said, and, but he kept saying, there's no way. There's no way. And like I said, I'd seen him walk, and he was 5'8"-ish. And I knew what he looked like up there. And this thing would have broke him in half. But anyway, I I wished, God, I wished I had known. (laughs) Maybe I don't, but I wished I had known what to look for. I wished I had known, like the other night, we had a quiet night. What There wasn't a lot going on. We had some barred owls back and forth. And some people say sometimes, they get mimicked by whatever I have. We can do calls like that with our mouth. And we'll <clears throat> sometimes when it gets quiet, we'll start and we'll get them active just to get something going on. But then you'll hear some strange stuff like a barred owl that's on the ground. You know, it doesn't sound exactly like a bird, but I don't know. But there you go. It, you put all the things that happened together. And it makes a little more sense that it could be something like that. But so I did. Uh, I realized that I haven't done anything to get any responses. And I said, hey, so uh, let's go back. So we had frogs making their noises. We had a uh, whippoorwill or whatever, a bird. It was going nuts. We, we had some sounds going on, just listening. And then <clears throat> it got quiet. Just, you know, how it happens sometimes when a predator comes in, it could have been coyotes, whatever, mountain lions, whatever, it just get quiet. But I wasn't really thinking that. And like I said, I don't know what this was, but I'm like, you know what, this would be a good time to, I told my wife, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do three claps out the window. And let's listen. And her hearing, I have to be careful. I can't mumble under my breath. Because she, she can hear birds breaking seeds in our bird feeder. And she's a good one to have with you if you, you need a warning. But uh, so I did uh, I did three loud claps and quit. I didn't hear anything. And she, she, uh, she turned and she said, you just got to clap back over here. I said, wait a minute. Hand clap? She said, yes. Yeah. And how many? She it was just one. And <laughs> I don't know. I know I do know that there's nobody out there. <clears throat> and if she tells me it was a hand clout, I'm gonna go with her hearing. But after that happened, there was some strange sounds that she couldn't identify. But it, it wasn't a lot. But we say that's not a lot because we've had some so much happened at times that you just get a, a response back. I don't know what that could be. I don't know what could clap other than a person. But anyway, yeah, it, and there, there's so much more. I don't. I could go on. And, <sighs> Roger, Marshall County is having some things go on. That's for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I do want to ask real quick. I keep coming back in my mind. We ta- It was a while back. We were talking about how your son was hunting and he heard what he thought was a monkey sound in the woods. Yeah. Have you guys been ever been back to that area? Yes. we. I've got a video. I've got that my YouTube page. There's not a whole lot on it. Oh, okay. Cool. It's not a... And we took a... We did a walkabout. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and it... It takes a while because of the ridges. And, you know, I'm not an athlete, so we have to take time. And <clears throat> we went behind. This was just, uh, I'm going to say this was two, two and a half months ago. Because after I had done, I had told my story, and it's just a couple weeks in, I thought it would be fun to get some video and show people where you know, where we were at. So I said, here's what we want to do. I said, first of all, we're not going to be quiet because I don't want to slip up on anything. <laughs> I want everything to know we're here. The second thing, I want to go behind that clump of cedar trees to where the rock came from to see 
how something could have got gotten away or hid from us or where it could have been standing. And another thing I said, where you heard, he said it was like a monkey gorilla. Mm. The, he said it was a classic build up and the ooh, 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 yeah. and, said, and whatever. And so I said, we're going to go back on top of that ridge and we're going to look over and see what's there. And he's got a, you know, I'm 52. I don't, I'm not totally out of the tech stuff. He draws them this app up. It tells exactly where we're at, who owns what and where the houses are. I bet it's on X. And I'm like, I oh, use that too. It's great. It is. It is. Yeah. How far something is. Yeah. And who owns it. And what's scary is I believe it has the owner's phone number here. It, it's pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. It's intense. So we, yeah, we did go back there and we looked off the ridge to where it could have been. And as far as we could see, you would see a, a speck of white here, there, houses just sparsely through this valley. And then another ridge way over there and <clears throat> just nothing, wow. just nothing. And the behind the cedar trees, <sighs> I don't see how. Whatever it was, it had to stay put. Mm. I don't see how with the terrain and the leaves and the, I think it would have exposed itself. And maybe that's why it threw a rock at us. It it was last resort. We were getting close. And if we had walked 15 more yards or 20 more yards, we might have seen something we might not want to do. But so maybe we pressured it to do that, to have that response without knowing. So. It would have had to. It would have had a, a pretty long run up the hill, or anybody that was back there. So it didn't have a, an escape route. So that's what I was telling Peyton. I'm like, we may have pressured it into doing that, and then, but once you get up on top of the ridge, you can be in some of these hollows really fast. Mm. You know, you could get some distance between you if it was, if it was a, a person, and especially like deer. And we know that we know how they do. So it makes, it just makes sense that any animal would use the ridges in the same way. He still goes by himself sometimes. It's just, it worries me. Even though I'm confident that he'll do the right thing and he's learning that you don't just shoot first. We had that scary, we had that scary thing happen. And, and when I started, when I said, clear your mind, he actually set his rifle down. I didn't tell him to, he just, for some reason he set it down and did his hands like this. And he, could we, I guess we're so in tune, but anyway, wow. he, He's heard some strange noises and stuff, but like I said, we talked about it and said, I said, have you ever felt threatened? He said, no. And Kevin, my buddy that saw the one trying to get the calf, he made a comment and it it rung true. Somebody asked him on the show, they're like, or did it keep you from going hunting? Did it keep you from going fishing? Did it scare you? Did it? He said, he's just, he's more country than I am. If you can believe that. He said, the way I figured it, if he's there, what I saw, he's always been there, and he's mm-hmm. never bothered me before. And, of course, he's saying he because we all think Bigfoot. Right. <laughs> and he said, so I don't let it bother me because if he wanted to get me, he could have got me that day because I was right there. Sure. So, you know, that, and that's comforting. Now, you get to talking to some of these people with the dog men and stuff, like, then you get on a totally different. Is that it? It's saddle up partners when you start in. Yeah. I mean, you can go down, you can go far down the road, Roger. You're aware of that. It's Mm -hmm. not just Bigfoot, but, but man, this has been a enjoyable chat and you guys got some stuff going on down in Marshall County, Tennessee. And I'm definitely going to be keeping up to date with you. Roger, how, can, do you mind sharing a few 
taking a few minutes to share how people can keep up to date with what you got going on. <laughs> also, if they're like, man, I've got something that happened in Marshall County, Tennessee, right. how can they get in touch with you? It sounds like they need to let you know. Well, I set up an email <laughs> like all of us do. Nice. Yep, you, yep. you want to keep it separate from your other, your business. Exactly. But it's a squatch and holler. That's without a G. And okay. it's O L E R. And that's at gmail.com. So I wanted it, something to be memorable. And so that squatch and holler could be anywhere. So, yeah, if you have anything, I'd be glad to listen. If you're in this area, even we're not far from Moore County, which is where Jack Daniels is. Mm-hmm. It, and it, there, there are ridges where you can get on these ridges and go forever. And people like uh, Davy, is it Davy Crockett? Yeah, Davy Crockett is just over, not far from here, where he lived on Bean Creek. And there's a lot of history in this area. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of uh, Native American mounds that people really don't know about. Oh, I, yeah. I, one of our favorite pastimes when somebody would work the ground up for tobacco or whatever with kids, it would rain and we would go just fill our pockets with arrowheads, you know. And there's a, so much history in this area. And I just did not know <laughs> that there was Bigfoot history. Yeah. Like I said, I've probably, I could probably come up with half a dozen more pretty cool stories, but I know we've been on a while. So you could probably write a pretty good book too, Roger. <sighs> just saying, but hey, I'll just put that out there. But <laughs> man, it's been fun chatting with you. I'm I'm going to be keeping tabs on you, like I said, and okay. I think we'll be chatting some sometime in the future too. And maybe catching I, up with you. If I get any video or pictures or anything that I can share it to the Facebook group, right? Or you? Oh, yeah, totally. Or you messenger, or whatever. Yeah, totally. I haven't got anything. I will send you the I, what people have said the cloaking. Now it could be it's freaky because I've seen. I just have to send it to you. It blew my mind. It blew my son's mind, the game warden. And I've had people who are on the woo side of it. So I'm explaining what the energy and all this stuff and how they suppose, supposedly cloak. I just, all I know is when I saw the picture, the screenshot, nobody had mm. seen that yet. And I won't say I freaked out. I just, I just like, man, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but I'll send that to you. And all right. Yeah. I, I really appreciate, you know, it, cause it helps. And every, anybody out there, if Jeremiah contacts you and wants you to tell your story, don't be bashful. We're all here. We're here for you. It helps. It, it helps you feel better. And if you're in Marshall County, Tennessee or somewhere else, your friends might not even hear this, but do help him out. Share it. You, Share the podcast with everybody because you never know what kind of stories you're going to hear from your friends that they were scared to tell you. That man, that's great. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate that. And man, keep doing the good work. And uh, thank you so much for hanging out tonight, Roger. Oh, it's been fun. I'm just glad we finally got to do it. But you, uh, I, I really appreciate it. It do, it does help. If you'd like to support Bigfoot Society with a special one-time donation, you can head over to our Buy Me a Coffee page. The link will be in the show notes. We'd like to shout out this week, uh, especially Henry Franzoni and Anonymous, both for buying us a few coffees. Uh, this will be especially helpful on our trip out to Monster Fest next week. As you know, that airport food gets kind of pricey. The link will be in the show notes to the Buy Me a Coffee page if you'd like to help support with a one-time donation as well. Become a supporting member of the Bigfoot Society podcast by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society and receive extra episodes and early ad-free episodes as well. If you've got a personal Bigfoot encounter you would like to submit for me to share on the podcast, please head on over to www.bigfootsocietypodcast.com. There you'll find the Share Your Bigfoot Encounter form a little lower on the page, and please take a minute to share as many details as you can. 
please state if the encounter is anonymous or what name you would like associated with the encounter. And as always, thanks for listening.